Hey guys, thank you for joining me in the first episode of Slide Lock Radio. I'm your host, George Hill, aka the Mad Ogre at madogre.com. And I've got some topics I want to talk about real quick. First talk, uh, let's talk about uh, off-body carry. Uh, we've read in, and we've seen in the news, uh, a couple instances that have happened in the last couple months of uh, mothers with uh, concealed carry permits carrying in uh, their purse. This is what's called off-body carry because the weapon is not uh, attached to them physically with a uh, holster or uh, some other means, belly band, ankle band, shoulder holster, whatever. It's uh, not on their person. And if it's not on their person, they don't have full control over the weapon. And as a result, I do not recommend this method of carry for anybody. Uh, it's real popular with women, though, and uh, effeminate men, uh, guys running around with briefcases, laptop cases, whatever. They think they're going to just conveniently carry uh, the gun with them uh, in such a manner. This is not cool. This is patently uncool, as a matter of fact. I don't uh, condone it. I don't like it. Uh, I don't recommend it. Now, women complain that uh, they want to carry a, a gun for concealment, uh, for self-protection. They want to have a gun with them at all times. And yet they wear tight body-fitting, body-hugging clothes. And uh, they complain that there's no holster for them. Well, there's no magic holster that's going to uh, conceal a, uh, a reasonable self-defense type weapon. Uh, in skin type form fitting clothes. There's just no holster that exists for that. Um, if you're wearing yoga pants and a, a, tight, a tight bodice that looks like uh, you're wearing body paint, not that there's anything wrong with that. And I, I support your decision to dress like that. Uh, just fine. Knock yourself out. However, if you're going to carry a weapon just in such a manner, then don't complain that you can't hide it. Here's here's the reason why, ladies, and don't take this personally, but uh, you're not special, okay? You're not. You might be sexy. You might be smart. But you're not special. Every guy that carries a concealed weapon has to make some concessions for carrying that weapon. Those concessions might be uh, they have to change their wardrobe. They have to change the style of clothing that they that they uh, that they wear. They might have to uh, give up a few things, such as tight bodices and yoga pants. So I'm, I'm sorry, the guys who carry a weapon all the time. We have to change our wardrobe. We have to change our lifestyle because we have decided that self-defense and the Second Amendment is more important than a fashion statement. We've made that decision. As a result, we've had a lot of mm, fashion faux pas. There was a time when uh, it was very popular for guys to carry in fanny packs. This would allow them to dress normally and then have the fanny pack attached to them with the gun in the fanny pack. All's well. Well, that was ridiculous. Made everybody look like a tourist. There was the fad there for a while where everybody was wearing photographer's vests. And uh, pretty much that just became indication that, hey, this guy wearing a photographer's vest doesn't have a camera around his neck. Probably is not a photographer. Probably has a concealed carry. I've even seen the photographer's vest and the fanny pack, and I'm not making this up. This was in the early 90s. It was disturbing. Well, the photographer's vests, the fanny packs, well, there, there's no way of, of getting around it. You know, the, the other way uh, of dressing was to uh, dress like Weird Al Yankovic. Now, nothing wrong with his music. I think the guy is, uh, he's just bananas. I love listening to his music. Uh, he's hilarious. I even watched this movie VH, was it VH1, VHS1, can't remember the name of the movie, but uh, 
it was funny. It was a lot of funny. It, it, it was a good movie. I, I enjoyed it. Anyway, moving on. Don't want to dress like Weird Al, which means I dress like this quite often. Hoodie, look like a thug. Better that than look like, hey, that guy's got a gun on him. Well, maybe this is now the new giveaway. Don't know. We change. Anyway, for you ladies, you're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to change. You're going to have to uh, give up wearing the tight-fitting clothing uh, if you're going to carry a gun for self-defense. Because uh, we saw a report where uh, a lady in Walmart was carrying uh, off-body carry in her purse. Her kid was uh, started playing around with the purse, got the gun out, shot and killed his mother. That's a tragedy. There's another incident that happened a few weeks after that where mother had the gun in the purse. Mother should have known better. Kid got into the purse, shot mom and dad. Luckily, I believe they're both lived, so no tragedy there, but just a drastically unfortunate incident. By the way, if you can find this stuff, Pepsi Cola, vanilla flavored, made with real sugar, this stuff is the bomb. <clears throat> so good. <clears throat> I apologize. <clears throat> uh, I discovered that stuff last summer and uh, couldn't find it for a long time and uh, just found some recently. Oh my gosh. So creamy, so delicious. Getting back on point, um, ladies, um, you got to make concessions like the guys have. Uh, quite often, if I'm not wearing a hoodie, uh, I'll wear clothes such as like a mechanic shirt. I've got a couple of those I really like. Um, just going untucked, dressing like uh, Dean Winchester from uh, Supernatural, that works well too. Uh, another way to dress is uh, just step it up a notch. Button down collar shirt, tucked in, sport coat. Um, that works very well too. I, I don't know any place where I can't go and be comfortable and that's, it, it just works. It's fine. But um, for you women uh, out there, you know, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any fashion suggestions. All I can suggest is uh, don't use a purse. Here's another reason why. Say you go to work. You're a professional working mom, uh, working lady. Uh, you got your career ahead of you. You got your day ahead of you. You dress up in your nice, nice outfit. You put your gun in your purse. You go to your office. And where do you put that purse when you're in your office? <clears throat> Probably in your desk drawer, under your desk. Okay, and then you go around the office doing your daily work, whatever, whatever it is you do. Um, <clears throat> say you're uh, uh, working in a busy office and you go down the hall to the copy machine or uh, you go to get a cup of coffee in the break room and where's your purse? It's down the hall, under your desk, in your desk drawer, not where you're at. And let's say while you're getting that cup of coffee, you hear shots fired. You hear up raised voices. Something's happening. Where's your defensive weapon? Down the hall, in their desk drawer, not on you. <clears throat> there was a news report very recently of a pharmacist who, uh, in his pharmacy, carrying concealed, had the gun on him. A thug comes in the door wearing a mask. After a few seconds, the thug then attempts to rob the place. This is an unfortunate situation because the pharmacist ended up killing the guy, and that is unfortunate. When we shoot in a defensive situation, we shoot to stop the threat. We don't shoot to kill anybody. We shoot to stop the threat. Here we had the pharmacist was con confronted with a threat. You had a thug with a gun, 
aimed it at employees, could have aimed it at customers. The pharmacist did the right thing. He drew his weapon, he engaged the threat, and put the threat down like a dog. He stopped the threat. The fact that this thug died later in the hospital, he was at the hospital when pronounced dead, that's not the fault of the pharmacist. That was not the goal of the, of the pharmacist. The goal was to stop the threat, and this is what the pharmacist did. The thug died as a side effect or as a result of his own poor actions, not the actions of the pharmacist. The pharmacist did his duty. He protected himself, he protected his employees, and he protected the customers that were in his store. He did a good job. This guy gets a medal. He is a hero. He stood up. It's unfortunate that somebody died in this. But it's also unfortunate that this thug decided that he was going to commit a crime. That's unfortunate. Um, he was able to carry concealed uh, wearing he, he was wearing a normal pharmacist outfit, you know, the scientist schmuck, whatever you want to call those things, lab coat. Um, he was dressed in such a manner that he could carry concealed and access the gun from concealment fairly quickly. Um, his draw was not the fastest, but it was effective. Uh, he did a good job. Now, if that pharmacist was in that same situation, and he had his gun in his briefcase, back at his desk, and <clears throat> carrying it off body, and was in that very same situation, how do you think that situation would have turned out? Well, the robbery probably would have been successful. Customers and employees could have been shot. Some of them could have been killed. Well, we can't play too much of the what ifs. We don't know. But what we do know is that the threat would not have been stopped. The pharmacist would not have had the ability to stop this thug. And the thug would be out on the street being able to continue doing his thuggish stuff. Don't have a crystal ball. Can't read into the future. Can't predict what would have been. But we know that the pharmacist was not in a position, would not have been in a position to react as he did. So we go from what is essentially a happy ending to what could have been a tragedy. But luckily the pharmacist took it upon himself to uh, take personal defense, personal safety, and the safety of his employees and customers uh, seriously. So that's a good thing. At least I think so. What do you think? Um, go to Slidelock Radio on Facebook. Uh, link will be at uh, Slidelock Radio, Slidelock.net. Uh, I'll have a link to the Facebook page, but Slidelock Radio on Facebook. And if you disagree with me on Off Body Carry, uh, post there and tell me why. That's the important thing. Don't just say, I disagree with you, you're stupid. Everybody's got an opinion, that's fine. Go ahead and give me your opinion, but give me reasons for your opinion. Why do you think the way you're thinking? Why am I wrong? If you disagree with me, tell me how and why I'm wrong. Don't just tell me I'm wrong. I'm wrong on the time. Educate me. Educate the audience. Why am I wrong on this? I know there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of women out there that are probably pissed. Oh wait a second, I'm not special. No, you're not. You've got to carry the gun on you on your person. You're beautiful. You're smart. You're talented. I'm sure you're all that in a bag of chips. But if you're going to carry a gun with your concealed carry permit. Carry the gun in a manner in which you always have full control of it all at all times. And carry it in a manner that you have 
rapid access to that gun at all times. Simple as that. That's all I'm saying. If you disagree with me on this, really you should reconsider whether or not you should be carrying a gun with you at all. Maybe keep it in your car, locked up, in a locked case, someplace where it's uh, where it's secure. Nobody can have access to it. That's one thing. But uh, <clears throat> carrying a gun just in the purse, where you you don't have full control over the purse at all times, I think is uh, it's foolishness. Same thing goes for guys wearing the satchels, the man bags, the uh, shoulder bags, however you want to call it. I've got one. I've got one right beside me over here. Do you want to see it? Sure, why not? Check it out. This is my tactical man bag. I've got, uh, <clears throat> what do I got here? Earmuffs, Ear Pro. For magazines, a pen, hmm, I don't seem to have a gun in here. Why don't I have a gun in here? I don't have a gun in here because I don't have full control over that gun at all times. And if I don't have full control over that gun at all times, that gun is going to be someplace more secure than sitting uh, beside me in a man bag, as cool as it is. I mean, I got the RMJ Tactical patch on there, looking cool. It's an OD green, which is probably my favorite color on earth for uh, textile-made products, firearms, vehicles, tanks, whatever. Anyway, not to kick a, a dead horse any further, but uh, you got to keep you got to keep control of the farm. The farm's got to be secure. You've got to control access to who has it. If you walk down the aisle into the thing, uh, into the break room, your purse is under your desk or whatever, and say nothing happens, but maybe somebody, a coworker, or a child is looking for something, sees your purse, goes into that purse, now they've gotten into where your gun is, and you don't have full control of it, and you're not even in the same damn room that the weapon is in anymore. That's not cool. Okay, I think we've, we, we can move on from this topic. You get my point. You should get my point. Again, if you disagree, this is America. Tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, don't post into the comment section here on the video. Uh, well, you can. I'm not going to respond to it. Uh, I'll respond to it on Facebook. Okay, because the stupidest comments I've ever read are YouTube comments. Second to that is Facebook comments, but let's let's not go there. Okay, let's go on to the next topic. I've covered off body care. You guys get my drift. Okay, next topic is frog loop. Oh my goodness. I have heard so much about frog loop this last two months. Uh, more than enough to uh, uh, satisfy a lifetime of my desire to hear about frog loop. Every time Frog Lube comes up, you Frog Lube proponents always hit me about how biodegradable it is, how non-toxic it is, and how food grade it is. Guys, you're not selling me a weapon lubrication based on its deliciousness. If I wanted deliciousness in my firearm, if I wanted to lube my gun with something edible and tasty, I would lube it with bacon. Okay. I've got two words for frog lube. Now, sit down and forgive my French. But fuck frog lube. I don't want to deal with a lubrication that you have to follow the instruction manual. I don't want a lubrication that you have to clean out all traces of any other lubricant. I don't want a lubrication that has a tech support department. It's lubricant. I, 
I don't care if I can eat it. I don't care if I can roll it up and smoke it. I don't care if I can brush my teeth with it. I want to know if I can lubricate my weapon with it. And here's the question I have about frog lube. If it's so dang good and it's so slick, then why does it get sticky when it sits too long? Now, I've tested frog lube myself. Lubed up the gun, and yes, it felt slick. It felt nice. And then I let the gun sit, and after sitting for a while, I then go and pick up and manually cycle the gun, and it feels sticky. It feels like it's full of goo. Because, quite frankly, it is. It's full of frog snot. Dried frog snot now, and now it's no longer sticky. And I'm told, oh, well, when it gets like that, all you have to do is put in a little bit more, and that'll refresh it. Okay, but if I let that gun sit again, now I've got even more sticky goo building up inside my firearm. This isn't helping me or my gun. This is not making me pleased. You might be fine with it. And if you are, more power to you. That, that's fine. That's fine. If you're down with frog loop, that, that's good for you. Okay? Made by SEALs, designed by SEALs, whatever. Uh, fantastic. I don't like it. That's just me. That's my opinion. Now, what I do like, though, is I like two things. Um, I like slipstream sticks, and I like fire queen. Now, I like slipstream sticks on the internal mechanisms of my firearms. You know, where all the mechanical happenings are going on, that's where I'm going to put the slipstream sticks. Now, when it comes to fire clean, I'm going to use fire clean everywhere else. Uh, outside the slides, the frames, uh, inside the slides, you know, uh, away from the frame rails, because I'm going to use slipstream on the frame rails. Um, that works great. I'm going to use fire clean on my knife blades. Uh, I'm going to use fire clean to clean off the rust. Because fire clean, it's got clean in the name. It's a good cleaner. I don't know about the fire. It's pretty cool, though, but uh, uh, it cleans very well. It puts a nice surface uh, lubricant uh, that protects, uh, I think, very well. Cleans off the metal surface very well and leaves a layer of protection that I think is absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> fire clean is good stuff. Now, I don't think it lubricates as well as slipstream, but it does very well. Now, here is one of my favorite knives. This is the Becker BK9, and you can see I've taken off the black coating. I'm not exactly sure what kind of coating that they put on there. It's a type of powder coating or whatnot, uh, but I took that off with the paint stripper. And what I did was, uh, when I did that, uh, the bare metal, which is a high carbon steel, it, uh, it can oxidize very quickly, uh, overnight, in fact. Now, the uh, fire clean protects this blade very well. Now, I can etch it using, uh, and there's YouTube videos on uh, mustard etching. I find sriracha sauce works very well as well. Um, but uh, I etched it to the point where and got it to the, uh, the patina that I like. I think it's a nice, attractive, usable blade. I use it for cooking all the time. But uh, fire clean on this blade keeps this blade uh, nice and protected. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it's a wonderful product. Wonderful product. Works very well. Becker BK9. If you see that. Heck yeah. That is the stuff. I recommend these knives highly. They're absolutely beautiful. But Fire Clean protects that blade. I think every bit as good as the original coating, the black powder coating. But I found that uh, 
with that coating off of the blade, the blade uh, cuts much, much more efficiently and effectively. But uh, I'm going to trust Fire Queen on uh, external metal surfaces, internal metal surfaces that need protection, and I'm going to trust Slipstream, specifically the Slipstream Sticks product, to lubricate the mechanical parts of my firearms and small machinery. Uh, I think I think that's that combination is a winning combination. Fire Queen cleans very well. I used to like uh, Impro 7 and used Impro 7 exclusively, and I still use a little bit of it, but uh, I'm converting very much to uh, just Fire Clean and Slipstream Sticks. <clears throat> okay, talked about off body carry, talking about uh, frog loop. Uh, let's talk about uh, air suitable optics. Just because uh, uh, a friend of mine, named Jason Wilson, who owns Lucid Optics. He's got a new optic coming out. He offered to send it to me to test uh, a prototype. And normally, I used to, I'd be all over that. And, you know, I really appreciate the offer of testing the prototype, uh, just because that's cool, you know, getting to play with something that nobody else gets to play with before. However, something happened uh, last year that has made me very cautious of doing this. Um, what happened was Remington came out with the R51 pistol. And the R51 pistol was tested by a number of gun riders. Uh, one of them is uh, our friend Jeff Quinn. Tested these products, tested these guns, these R51 at, uh, where was it, gun site in Arizona. Tested the guns, the gun ran great, people liked the guns and gave positive reviews. Well, they were testing pre-production examples. These were not the same guns that people were uh, then ordering and buying at Chacho, which happened uh, a few weeks after that. Well, kind of weird at Chacho, the media range day where all the gun companies have all the, the new guns and lets the media guys uh, test those guns out. That gun was noticeably absent at the media range day. That was a red flag to me, and I'm on record, and you can look this up at uh, wethearms.com on the forum there. Look up the R51 pistol, and look up my posts on the R51 pistol. I was uh, a voice of caution. You could say I was a hater, because I did not like the idea of this gun for some reason. It smacked wrong at me. Why well, bring out a commercial failure, you know, 50 years later and expect it to be any good. Don't get me started. I'm just not a fan. But uh, the people who bought the gun had a very different experience with that gun than the original gun riders who tested that pre-production prototype. And I don't blame the riders. I blame Remington on this uh, because uh, they set these guys up with... Uh, uh, specially prepared guns, ringers, and not production examples. So to make a long story short, because of that, I'm forever going to be very cautious uh, testing or reviewing anything that is not a production example. So uh, thank you very much for Lucid for giving me that offer. But uh, I will happily test a production example instead of a prototype. That's why. Um, the optic, though, sounds like it's going to be just the bee's knees. It's going to look very similar to uh, the HD7, which is a uh, optic that I have uh, on my son's AR. I've been running it on my own AR for quite a bit. Uh, I've had two of them, and I've had an area problem with any of them. Uh, the Lucids have been very good for me. Um, and you know, I was using in the tactical training in Utah. If you look up uh, the Crusader training photos um, that I have on my Facebook page, you will see uh, most of them. My optic uh, on that gun uh, was a Lucid after it replaced an EOTech. Yes, the Lucid HC7 replaced an EOTech because I liked it that much better. I had that much faith in it, and it gave me that much better performance that it replaced a known good tactical optic. 
Now, I'm sure there's guys out there that would uh, disagree with me on the Lucids, that even disagree with me, if your name's Larry Vickers, on the EOTech. And that's fine. Everybody's got their own opinions. But uh, from what I saw, what I handled, and then my own testing, I tested this Lucid on uh, shotguns, on a 50 cal, on a 22-250, on a 7mm, and on my AR-15, and shot the hell out of it through a number of tactical classes. And that optic held up to all of that abuse just fine. No problem with it. And it held zero. Switching between the reticles, I've got that on video, it held zero. The optic is fine. So there's no way that I'm thinking that this new magnified optic is going to be any lesser quality. It's going to be the same quality, adding in some magnification with a usable ballistic reticle. I like that. I like that a lot. I think that is going to be just tits. Now, there's another optic out there that I'm looking forward to trying. I want to try it as soon as I can. Uh, it's just a little bit out of my price range right now because, hey, I've got six boys and i got to be careful with my money. The, uh, the optic is from an outfit called Leatherwood. Leatherwood uh, has been making scopes for a very long time, and you, very few people have heard of them. Um, it's just not a common name out there like Loophole and Nikon and Burris. But uh, uh, Leatherwood's making, uh, they've been making uh, Western replica optics. You know, something like a scope that you put on a Shiloh Sharps rifle. Uh, a scope that you put on like a 1873 Winchester. I mean, these are cool scopes. But uh, they've got a brand, uh, a subdivision of Leatherwood called Hilux. And Hilux is making these tactical scopes. And I believe they're called the CMR scopes. I'll have to look that up. <clears throat> uh, I'll look it up and I'll put a description, uh, put a link it, uh, to it in the description. But uh, I believe they're called the CMR scopes from Hilux. Um, these are one to four optics. They are uh, very high quality. I've played with them, you know, not on a gun, but uh, handled them, looked through them, uh, played with the adjustments, the turrets, the focus, and uh, illumination, and these scopes are absolutely fantastic. They look amazing. Very usable reticle with a nice fine uh, reticle for good target shooting at long long range. Uh, I don't like a thick reticle on uh, my scopes because if I'm shooting something at 200 yards I need to be able to place my shot on the target, not just hit the target, I need to place the shot on the target. And I can only do that if I got a fine reticle. Now there's some scopes out there that have got just huge big fat donuts with like a bite taken out of the bottom. So you got this crescent shape, this big fat horseshoe. Um, that might be fine for some guys. I'm not one of those guys. I don't like that. I, that bugs me. I don't want anything on the gun that bugs me. So uh, that Leatherwood scope is uh, very, uh, very tempting to me. I, if I remember right, the price is between, what, 450 550 somewhere in there. This is just off the top of my head. I don't remember. I haven't looked them up recently. But I want to get one of these scopes and run it and try it out. I was looking at uh, some of the loopholes. Loopholes got the fire dot. But it's got a great big huge circle with a, a reticle with the the only illumination is just the dot itself. And that's fine, but I don't know. It's, I, I'm not 100% thrilled with that reticle. Um, uh, not on an uh, optic that I'm going to use for like defensive purposes or three gun competition. Maybe it's just fine for those. But... Uh, you know, I want my uh, reticle to be a little bit more uh, technically helpful, especially with bullet drop. If I'm reaching out to 200 yards, not a big deal. If I'm reaching out beyond 200 yards, well, I want something that's going to give me those little holdover marks so that I can, you know, get proper elevation on my weapon so I can hit my target at those ranges. That's just me. Uh, I've been shooting long range for a long time out in Utah, shooting prairie dogs anywhere from 50 yards up to 600 yards, and having those holdover marks I find uh, are very helpful. 
And if I'm going to shoot a prairie dog, which is basically a little critter about the size of this bottle, that will either be standing up or laying down on its belly out there at 500 yards, I want to be able to hit that. That's a hard shot to make. And anything that helps me make that shot, I'm going to like that. And I'm going to use that as much as I can. Okay, so I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking uh, this new Lucid coming out is going to be fantastic, or this Leatherwood, I don't know. All I do know, though, is uh, uh, I need a little bit more help with that uh, these days because, uh, because of these. I'm now into uh, progressive trifocals, and uh, these things are, well, they're not for the timid. Uh, it takes a while to get used to. I'm still not used to them. I've had them for a month, and I'm still not used to them. They suck. Well, actually, no, they don't suck. They're very good, but it takes a while to get used to them. It sucks having to get used to them, is what I'm saying. Okay. So, anything that can help me get on target with my, my favorite AR is going to be a, a huge advantage for me, because, you know, I love my AR. Uh, it's a great gun, and... You know, I need all the help I can get with it. By the way, uh, Samsung Galaxy tablet, another big help. <clears throat> Speaking of the AR, I got a question for you guys. When I camoed up my rifle last time, I put on it the little Skull Guy logo from G Code Holsters. And, you know, nothing against G Code Holsters. Nothing against the holsters, they're fine. Good holsters. If you've got one and you like it, bully. That's that's great. But I'm no longer associated with that company. Yet that company's logo is still on my favorite AR. That's a little irritating to me. But the problem though is I like the camo pattern that I've got going on that AR. I just don't like the fact that I've got that logo on there. Because I interspersed the G-Code Skull Guy logo as part of the multicam pattern along that scope. And while it looks really cool, and it's not very apparent at first, I know it's there. And, you know, since I'm no longer getting a paycheck from G-Code, I'm thinking, you know, I really don't necessarily need that logo on my gun. So I'm thinking about repainting it. Now, if I do repaint it, do I put another logo on there? Maybe my own logo. I don't really have a logo. But I could do my own thing. Or I could do no thing at all and have no logo on there and just have camo. The point of camo is not to look cool, but to break up the appearance of the gun. That being said, as the gun sits right now, it breaks up the appearance very well. So it does what camouflage is supposed to do. It camouflages the gun. And I have to say I did a very good job on it. But I know that logo is there. I think I'll have to repaint it. I don't know. What do you guys think? Should I ignore it? Or should I have some fun and repaint it? Carry on. I don't know. Anyway, tell me what you think. Okay, last, last topic I want to talk about real quick. Now, there's a lot of videos on YouTube, and there's a lot of people out there who are experts, people who call themselves experts. And I know one guy specifically who refers to himself as a great expert uh, in the firearms industry. By the way, that is nothing I, you will ever hear me say. I will never refer to myself as an expert. I, I just don't. I will refer to myself as an enthusiast. I'm an enthusiast because I don't think that there is any experts in the gun industry. You can't be an expert on everything in the gun industry. Now, you can be an expert on areas, certain segments of the gun industry, but you cannot be a gun industry expert. There's no such thing. There's just too much. There's too much for any one person to learn, to know, and it always changes. So even if you are an expert now, well, come mid-cycle, mid-season cycle, new products come out, you don't know about all of those yet, do you? 
So no, you're not an expert. But these experts that I know of, one guy in particular, calls himself an expert, has been in the gun industry for a number of years, has bought so hook, line, and sinker into rip ammunition. And that just bothers me. And here's why. Uh, most every instructor, most every expert uh, or uh, enthusiast or however you call all the best trainers, all the best uh, instructors, they say that you need to fire a good number of rounds through your firearm with your given choice of carry ammunition to verify whether or not that this ammunition is going to be reliable for you. Now, RIP ammunition is hideously expensive. I will let you do the math on this. But if you're going to fire at a base minimum 200 rounds of this ammunition through your gun, I guarantee you, you could have afforded to have bought a very nice second gun for that much ammunition with this stuff. I don't know anybody who is not marketing for them or working for them directly that has fired enough of this ammunition through a gun to verify that it's reliable with that ammunition in that gun. I don't know anybody, not one. If you have, please enlighten me. Tell me about how, 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 you've, how you've done this and how this gun has performed with, for you with this ammunition. Um, because, uh, you know, unless you have evidence of this and proof of this, I'm going to call you a liar. Because people right now in this Obama economy uh, cannot afford, you know, 400 bucks worth of ammo just to see if it's good enough ammo to carry. I don't know anybody uh, that's doing that these days. If you are, please enlighten me. Uh, show me a link to your video with all the empty packaging with all the empty brass with this ammo that you've shot and all this testing that you've done that proves that this ammo is reliable in your gun. There's a lot of variables to this, but I don't think you're going to get the proper uh, feeding reliability. And I certainly don't think that that bullet is going to perform adequately to the point that it justifies that insane price. I just don't see that happening. Now, here's the thing. There is no such thing as a magic bullet. I've written an article about this. It's called Terminal Ballistics. It used to be called Magic Bullets because this cycle has repeated itself with newfangled wonder bullets that are going to be the font of all evil destruction in the world. Um, these things come out. The uninitiated buy into the hype. They buy a lot of the ammo, and then they realize wow, this ammo is really not all that special. It really does not do all that it's advertised and all that it says it's supposed to do. And it, there is still evil existing in the world, even, even in spite of the existence of this ammunition. So the people who have bought into it realizes that it's a waste of money, it becomes less popular, and it fades out. And then new ammo comes out a few years later. And it attracts and garners the attention of a new generation of people, new shooter 2.0s that are new to the gun industry. Uh, most of the guys buying into rip ammo have never heard of Mullins bullets, Mullins ammunition. You've heard of Extreme Shock. You've seen Extreme Shock, and they have had a wonderful advertising campaign. And, uh, you know, they make uh, some nice ammunition, but also it's hideously expensive. And now here's Rip Ammo from a different company that's doing the same thing as the Mullen stuff and the Extreme Shock stuff. And it is the new, uh, you know, faux hammer of, uh, you know, 2015. Here's the thing, though. It cannot do what it says it does because of simple Newtonian physics. You've got weight. You've got momentum. You've got energy. All of these things play apart. Now, we know from biology, or you should know from biology, elementary level biology, that the cells in watermelons, plant cells, are different from animal cells. You should know that. You should also know that living tissue, meat, behaves differently than dead tissue, dead meat. 
It's just different. Different responses. And little tiny slivers of metal that don't weigh anything injected into tissue, uh, being at watermelon at 3,000 feet per second is one thing, or uh, being living tissue where the body is going to immediately start reacting to stop the bleeding. It's going to immediately react to start healing and uh, to recover from the wound that it just it just took. The body is very good at responding to that. The human body is wonderful at absorbing a lot of damage. It really is. The human body can sustain a great deal of damage and keep working and recover. And even recovering, you know, 80 to 100 percent. It's very good at that. So these little tiny slivers of uh, gilded metal, it's not impressing me. I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it as worth it. If you think it's worth it, hit me back. Respond to me on the Facebook page, SlideLock Radio on Facebook, SlideLock.net, or here in the comments, even though I probably won't respond to the comments on this site. Um, that's just me. But uh, respond and tell me, and educate and enlighten me. Tell me why. Don't tell me I'm wrong. Everybody can say I'm wrong. And nobody can tell me why I'm wrong, though. But you tell me why I'm wrong in this case and why I should consider RIP ammunition, why I should take it seriously in light of the article. The article I wrote is going to be uh, linked to in the description of this video. I'm going to put that up there. Anyway, tell me I'm wrong. Tell me why I'm wrong. If you can, I dare you. I challenge you. Because this is, you know, hey, that's cool ammo. I would love to like that stuff. I would love to have a couple magazines full of rip ammo instead of Winchester PDX-1. Okay? Winchester PDX-1, that's a pretty dang good bullet at a very good price, to a very reasonable price. The cost of these bullets for the performance I'm getting out of this ammunition is very acceptable. It's very reasonable. Rip ammunition, though, being uh, two, three, four, five times more expensive than this ammunition, what benefit am I really getting out of that stuff? Because I'm not getting full bullet weight. I'm not getting full penetration. I don't think I'm getting my money's worth out of that. You know what that stuff is? Rip ammunition, that is the, uh, that's the Rice Krispies. Of bullets. I mean, if you take your uh, your uh, your breakfast cereals out there, and you got your hearty wheat checks cereal, or even your life cereal, cinnamon life. Ooh, cinnamon life with vanilla almond milk is very good. That's a good breakfast. I like that stuff. But uh, you know, I can eat a bowl of that at breakfast time around nine o'clock, and I can make it all the way to lunch without getting hungry again. Rice Krispies, though. I eat a bowl of Rice Krispies at 9 o'clock. At 9.45, I'm ready for another bowl because I'm hungry again. Rip ammunition is Rice Krispies. It's full of a lot of air, not a lot of substance. There's a lot of hot air going on about that crap. If you like it, though, hey, more power to you. And if you're making Rice Krispie treats, all the better. Good for you. I guess Rice Krispies isn't uh, all that great of an analogy because Rice Krispies doesn't cost 60 bucks a box. Hey, whatever, man. You spend your money on whatever you want to spend your money on. Anyway, I'm your host, George Hill, the ogre at madogre.com, we the arm.com and Slidelock Radio. Thank you for being here. If you have any questions for me, or any points you'd like to make, any topics you'd like me to cover, hit me up. I'm listening. We'll talk about it later. See ya.